keto bread, keto waffles. Yes, you can actually make healthy bread and healthy waffles. Not just healthy, but stuff that's not going to spike your blood sugar through the roof. And you are about to learn how. Uh, But before that, I want to tell you about something else that can stabilize your blood sugar. Alkalinity. And what's a fantastic way to be alkaline? It's to consume greens. And the best tasting green superfood blend on the face of the planet is a sponsor of today's show and is something that I put into my smoothie every single day because rather than me having to chop up a whole bunch of vegetables, I can just put a scoop of this stuff into my smoothie and it's like dropping a salad into my smoothie. Or if I just decide to eat it straight out of the jar, which I have been known to do, same thing, salad in 10 seconds flat. No shopping, no juicing, no blending, no cleanup. Uh, It's organic, vegan, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free. even has the Ayurvedic herb ashwagandha in it, which lowers your cortisol And if you're a hard-charging, high-achiever, go-getter like me, that's something you need. So you get a 20% discount off of this fantastic green juice when you use discount code BEN at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Organifi. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Organifi. While you're there, check out their red juice too. And the red juice is amazing. Sweet, fruity flavor. It's got all sorts of blood builders in it. And you use discount code Red Ben to get 20% off of Organifi's red juice at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Organifi. Taste it. Uh, I made that up, by the way. That's not their byline. That's mine. Taste it. Um, Okay, this podcast is also brought to you by Health Gains. Uh, Health Gains is an amazing anti-aging institute in Aventura, Florida, South Florida. Now, I go down there a few times a year, and they make me young. They particularly do work on my crotch to turn me into a, a crotch machine. Uh, they, they enhance your nether regions with like shots and sound wave therapy and all sorts of drug-free, surgery-free, pain-free sexual wellness treatments. But they also do a lot of uh, anti-aging treatments. And the guy who runs it, Dr. Richard Gaines, amazing Harvard-trained pioneer in the use of hormone replacement therapy, you get 250 bucks off of seeing the same anti-aging doc that I personally see uh, all you got to do is text the word GAIN to 313131. That's the word GAIN, G-A-I-N, to 313131, and you automatically get 250 bucks off of any of the health gains. HGH treatments, testosterone treatments, uh, which I don't do because I compete in World Anti-Doping Association sanctioned sports, but if I didn't, I would. Uh, but I take advantage of all their other services, and they're amazing. Of course, their sexual health services are the ones that are my personal fave. So text word GAIN, 31, 31, 31. Check it out. And now on to today's show about how you can stuff your face with ketogenic waffles. In this episode of the Ben Group from Fitness Show. I'm dealing with a lot of metabolically damaged women, a lot of them going through menopause, really, you know, struggling to lose even five pounds. Most of the time it takes people, you know, two to three weeks to a month to adapt to hunger going away um, and that type of stuff. So a fat bomb a lot of times would help people just get rid of that hunger. Like I grew up, my mom told me, you know, finish everything on your plate. So I'm a product of the Clean Your Plate Club. And so I like making smaller desserts so I don't eat the whole thing. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy All the information you need in one place, right here, right now, on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Hey folks, if you have ever wondered if there is such a thing as ketogenic bread, aka keto bread, uh, or keto waffles, uh, specifically keto chicken and waffles, or keto (laughs) fruit salad, or any other kind of low-carb ketogenic option for foods that you probably would have never thought could be low-sugar or low-carb, then you're in for a treat on today's show. 
because my guest on today's podcast has not only written a copious, a dizzying number of books on ketosis and ketogenesis, uh, she is a nutritionist. Uh, she is an exercise physiologist. She, like I mentioned, is an author. She's a blogger. She's written the ketogenic cookbook. She's written quick and easy ketogenic cooking. Um, I recently read three of her books, The 30-Day Ketogenic Cleanse, Keto Comfort Foods, and keto restaurant favorites. And my mouth was watering during all three. <laughs> uh, even though I'm not even like a, a big ketogenic guy anymore, like I love the idea of being able to control blood sugar with some of these foods, even if you're not freaking like, you know, measuring your blood ketones every morning when you wake up. It's still pretty cool to learn how to avoid a lot of these high glycemic starchy foods and, and sugars from a longevity and an energy and a gut fermentation standpoint. So I love it when books like this come around. And Maria, I want to welcome you to the show yeah. and warn you, I have a boatload of questions for you about, about ketogenic cooking and the ketogenic diet. <laughs> well, I am very grateful, Ben. Thank you for having me. And uh, well, thank you for reading my books. I really appreciate it. And when I just tried to call you, you were like hiking in the wilderness and you had to like pull your car over for, for a solid <laughs> internet connection. Is that, is that true? Yeah. Yeah, I'm living in a, a tent for a while. It's my little boy's eighth birthday, and we like to just fish and hike and swim and do all of that. And so we, we tried to hike to the top of this uh, mountainous area, um, and it really wasn't working, so we had to drive around, which I don't really like to even be in my car, so it's like, oh, bummer. But we found a spot, and it's all good, so I'm very appreciative. <laughs> wow, cool. So you're just like out <laughs> living in a tent. Oh yeah. I, I, I think I was, I mean, in my past life, I was a uh, native American that lived in a tent and that's where my happy place is. I just love to, um, just be with nature and be outside. And I even have, um, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but cold therapy, I have like a cold shower outside and cause I don't even like to go inside to do that. I love it. A woman after my own heart. And, <laughs> and having written these, these ketogenic cookbooks, I'm curious what, what what would kind of like your your camp pantry look like as far as a replacement for say like you know graham crackers and s'mores and refried oh, yeah. beans? Um, they don't even my children that are with me. They don't even know what that stuff is. But um, we uh, have been frying up some fish. Um, we haven't caught any here yet, so we we definitely we pack some with. Um, I always bring hamburger, and well, we make hamburgers on the grill and. Gosh, you name it. My kids love my like skillet spaghetti, which is really, really easy. And we'll uh, just take ground up hamburger and we'll fry that up, put some seasoning in there and uh, some uh, tomato sauce that I bring with. And uh, we'll just do that. And, you know, you could put them over zoodles, but we just like it plain. So we, we do that a lot, too. I mean, eggs and bacon. That's when you say zoodles, I assume you're referring to like zucchini noodles yeah oh, okay. yeah the you know the keto word for zoodles but we don't even you know get into those too much so we just eat it plain but i mean bacon and eggs are a staple breakfast and um i don't know i guess i've i grew up loving food obviously it caused a lot of issues with my you know childhood um and you know i still love food i just like to make it a little different and like you said whether or not you want to check your ketones i'm a minimalist i don't like gadgets i don't like any of that stuff so um you know i don't test but obviously we're you know my whole family we're eating about you know 10 carbohydrates a day i'm pretty sure we're in ketosis it certainly feels like it anyway our energy's through the roof and uh we don't yeah. touch caffeine or anything like that. Yeah, interesting. Well, I, I certainly do a lot of green tea and caffeine, and I believe my children <laughs> had, indeed, because they have a friend over today who's uh, who, uh, who <laughs> travels with his cereal. I didn't realize oh, children these no. days travel with their cereal, but he travels with his cereal, so my kids had his cereal. It wasn't too bad. It's like some kind of like a organic rice crispy thing with coconut milk, but uh, anyways, they usually do bacon and, and eggs. And of course I've yeah. got my, my plant-based high fat smoothie that I do in the mornings. Yeah. I've got a, I've got some questions for you. Cause you, you go into some stuff in your book that I hadn't seen before. Like you talk about maintaining lean muscle when you're on a ketogenic diet, maintaining lean yeah. muscle. And one of the things that you talk about in that discussion, uh, and, and this would be in the, the ketogenic cleanse book, you talk about using, potassium to maintain mm -hmm. lean muscle when on a ketogenic diet. Why do you talk so much about potassium in that section? 
Well, when you do, you know, a low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet, what what happens is a lot of people complain of low energy or even sometimes low moods or heavy legs walking upstairs. And what's going on there is carbohydrates help retain water. And when you go on a low carb or ketogenic diet, obviously you don't have those carbohydrates to retain water, but along with that water loss goes a lot of electrolytes like potassium. And the important thing about potassium is it combines with magnesium to help aid in muscle contraction, control, and growth. And, you know, protein needs potassium to hold on to those amino acids in your body. And so if you don't get enough potassium, if you're losing it because you don't have that, you know, carbohydrate to retain those electrolytes, you know, along goes that energy, uh, the muscle contraction is not going to be there. So your runs or exercising is going to be more difficult. And so a lot of times when people say, well, I tried low carb or ketogenic diet, it just didn't serve me well. A lot of times it's those little tips that you need that will get you past those issues that happen in the beginning. Yeah. And, and I don't, I know it happens a lot of times in terms of the sodium potassium ratio getting, uh, it would, it would be uh, larger when people are on a, on a ketogenic diet and you can't exactly eat potassium, obviously when, or you you can't exactly eat uh, uh, a bananas, you know, in copious amounts when you're in ketosis. So when it comes to potassium, I know that magnesium is important because it helps yeah. aid in the absorption of potassium. And for a lot of people who are on a, like a lower carbohydrate or a ketosis-based diet doing like a transdermal or an oral magnesium or something like that is a good idea. But when it comes to potassium, do you actually recommend for people who are who are on a ketogenic diet to supplement with potassium or do you have like certain higher fat, lower carbohydrate foods that would be more rich in potassium that you would do instead or both? Uh, you know what's crazy? What most people don't realize, you when you think potassium, like you said, banana, or some people think potatoes, mm-hmm. you know what's great? Beef. Beef is where it's at. Beef is where it's at. And so many people are afraid of beef, but you know, we get a cow from the neighbor, a grass-fed cow, and beef is where it's at. So don't be afraid of your beef. Get that on. Avocados have quite a bit of potassium too. Yes, they do. Yep. So there's other ways to get it. Um, I do have people that do need to supplement with it in the beginning just to get them pl- past that plateau of that low energy. Yeah. And one other I'd throw in there, by the way, would be squash. You talked about zoodles. And I know squ- squash is kind of, you know, it, it's definitely not a high glycemic index carbohydrate. And I would say it would definitely be something that a lot of people who are eating low carb or slow carb would be able to handle just fine. But that's another decent source of potassium as well. So yeah, there there are things other than than bananas that you can eat <laughs> to maintain. Yep. But but I I do appreciate that you go into that in the book that a lot of people will salt their food because they hear they're supposed to do extra electrolytes on a low carbohydrate diet. And that's certainly important to maintain energy levels, you know, as you dump glycogen and as you dump minerals. Uh, however, uh, the specific two that I think people really need to go out of their way to do that I wish I'd have known more about back when I was doing a lot of Ironman triathlon competitions in full ketosis is potassium and magnesium specifically, like going yeah. out of your way to get those. Uh, you talk about in the part of the book where you discuss healing the mitochondria, you have a whole bunch of tips in there. One of the things that you describe is the keto snow cone. <laughs> what is the keto snow cone? Well, I'm going to get in trouble with the, like all the dental hygienists out there, but, um, we make uh, shave ice. We uh, stay in Hawaii over the winter. You know, Wisconsin could be quite co- cold and they have that uh, shave ice everywhere. And so we make our own. We got a little shave ice machine and we make it um, just about every night. My kids love it too. And then we just add our own little um, natural sweetener that, uh, you know, basically stevia based um, to give it that little bit of, um, you know, flavor to it, but even just plain ice, if you wanted to go there and I'll I'll say to, you know, with those dental hygienists out there saying, don't chew on ice. Um, you know, shave ice is very fine. You basically just suck on it, but this is just getting your body temperature down too often. We're told to take like warm showers before bedtime or anything like that. But, you know, shrinking that mitochondria makes it much more efficient. Um, and like, you know, being an athlete, 
that's another great way to grow your mitochondria too, is um, getting your exercise on. Too many people think that exercise is for like the whole calories in, calories out thing. Um, it's more about building that healthy mitochondria, which is going to benefit you way longer in the long run than um, yeah. focusing in on that calories in, calories out. Yeah, I, I interviewed uh, Dr. Mercola, and we geeked out on oh, mitochondria good. quite a bit. Probably, probably his new book, Fat is Fuel. Uh, Dave Asprey has a has a good recent book uh, called Headstrong that is that's also uh, a great resource for mitochondrial health. Uh, but ultimately, you are correct. Movement is one of the best things that you do. Movement, light, air, water; those are some of the biggies. Uh, but to return to this keto snow cone, just to make <laughs> sure I understand here properly, you've got a shaved ice machine. Just like yeah. one of these basic shaved ice machines, and you're just doing shaved ice with stevia. That's it. Well, it's like a it's it, it is basically a, a mixture like a stevia, but it's um they, they make fruit punch flavored and um, different flavors that you can add, whatever grape. Now, or, why wouldn't why wouldn't you put like you know coconut milk or uh, I guess you could use like an MCT oil or something like that to add extra flavor or texture, but. Uh, why why wouldn't you kind of add in other things on top of the shaved ice or have you experiment with things other than just like stevia? Well, you certainly could. However, that would take you out of your fasting. So if you have that in w within your fasting, I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting. Oh, so you're going, you're going 100% calorie free. So this would be like a lot of people do like a high fat ice cream or something like that in the evenings. You're just saying what you would do, you, what you would use this for would be if you just want to no, do no calories at all. It's just basically stevia and shaved ice. Right. And, you know, if you it. wanted to, <laughs> if you wanted to add, you know, some fat to it or whatever, but that's, you know, going to take you out of your fasting window. Okay. Got it. Well, I'm a big fan of Omica Organic Stevia. I, I get a, a three pack from them about every month. Nice. It's vanilla and butterscotch and oh, plain. Yeah. And it's, it's really good stevia. It doesn't have like maltodextrin and stuff in it no, like some of the, the Coca Cola brands do. Uh, now, you also talk about how one of the common mistakes people make when they're on a ketogenic diet is consuming too many seeds and nuts. Uh, why do you say that? Um, well, in school, we all learn that, you know, carbohydrates or uh, nuts are in that carbohydrate family. A lot of people think of them as fat or protein, but they're actually in the carbohydrate family. And a big mistake that people do is they subtract fiber from the total carbohydrates to get net carbohydrates. Right. And if you want to be successful, you're going to want to count total. I mean, do I have a lot of athletes at your caliber? Absolutely not. I'm dealing with a lot of metabolically damaged women. Uh, a lot of them going through menopause, really, you know, struggling to lose even five pounds, um, doing everything that they are, you know, trying. And so, you know, I'm dealing with that very metabolically damaged population. And that's okay. where we cut nuts and seeds and, you know, especially flax and chia and all that type of stuff that's very estrogenic. And that's that belly fat that you are concerned about for, you know, women and even some men. So you would you would say that when people are eating nuts by the handful yeah. and assuming like, let's say macadamia nuts, right? Those are very popular as a ketogenic yeah. food. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they have about four grams of carbs in, a, mm -hmm. in an average serving of macadamia nuts. And maybe two of those are comprised of fiber. And so a lot of people will say, well, I only count that macadamia nut as being not to get too orthorexic here, as two, you know, grams of carbohydrates. And what you're saying is you count the full four grams. And in addition yeah. to that, you're careful with mouth stuffing with too many seeds and nuts when people are trying to maintain ketosis, because a lot of people don't realize that both the normal sugars, as well as the, the fiber-based carbohydrate in something like a seed or a nut can actually keep you from for example, uh, restoring insulin sensitivity or yeah. restoring uh, pancreatic cell activity or doing some of the other things that you would want for someone who would be using full on ketosis for something like, you know, management of, uh, you know, anything from diabetes to Alzheimer's or, or something right. like that. Right. And like, um, when you chew crunchy things, whether it be nuts or chips or something with crunch, there's something called sensory space specific satiety try to say that really fast, but that means where it's not even in your mouth that you're feeling this, it's in your ear and it's an addictive 
thing that happens and it feels fantastic to your body. And so you usually overeat anything crunchy, whether it be chips, crunchy cookies, nuts. And also if you hold, you know, nuts in your hand, in each hand, and one has, you know, 450 calories, one has 250, they almost look the same. I mean, it's really easy to overeat them, but also dairy and nuts are constipating. And that's something that I do see a lot with my clients is that, okay, I started this diet and now I'm not going number two. And there's a whole bunch of issues going on. But, um, you know, if you want to have success, you want to cut, um, you know, dairy and nuts to get, because you want to go number two every day. That is an issue. If you're not, and your doctor says, oh, well, your body's always been like that. You're normal. That's not what you don't want to have that happen because those estrogens get reabsorbed. It's a whole nother issue that's going on. Estrogens get reabsorbed. What do you mean by that? Um, if you if you aren't eliminating daily, that's how you eliminate toxins and all of that. So there's three different types of estrogens that a woman produces. One is only when she's pregnant. I'm not talking about that. One is from her ovaries. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about external estrogens, whether it be from alcohol, um, environmental factors, topical products. Your those are all very they're they're producing this estrogenic like effect. And that's estrogen dominant cancers would be like prostate cancer in men. So they can have that thyroid cancers, ovarian, uh, breast cancer. Those are all estrogen dominant cancers. And so they get reabsorbed and basically locked inside those fat cells, making not just weight loss very difficult, but causing that unwanted belly fat and a lot of health issues like, you know, the cancers I was just uh, describing. Okay, got it. So essentially, the 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 takeaway here is that if you're trying to do a ketogenic diet and you're having difficulty getting some of the therapeutic effects of it, be careful with seed and nut consumption, and especially be careful with excess consumption of some of the more potentially estrogenic seeds like flax or chia, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Got it. Now, um, <laughs> I man, I would love to to dive into kind of like the the potential anti-breast cancer effects of things like uh, some of these mm-hmm. estrogenic foods when we look at them in Japanese cultures. But I, I, uh, I don't have time to, to delve into that right now, but I, I certainly have my own thoughts on on some of these, these estrogenic type of foods when it comes to the health effects of some of them in their fermented and properly prepared forms, as you right. would find in a lot of Japanese or Okinawan cuisines. And yes. I, I certainly I agree do with have... You plenty of high, high quality, uh, misos and, you know, fermented forms of soy, natto, things along those lines upstairs. Yes. But, but yeah, I think that's, that, that is different than like powdered flaxseed. I agree. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, anyways, discussion for another day, but, uh, I want to delve into sweeteners. Uh, what are the top sweeteners that you like? You mentioned stevia. You also mentioned in, uh, both your books, keto comfort foods and also the, the keto cleanse. You mentioned how you blend sweeteners sometimes. So fill me in on sweeteners and some of your best practices for sweeteners and the ones that you like. Well, I'll say this. Some people are like, well, why do you even allow that? But I want to say that, um, like I told you earlier, I grew up, you know, loving food. I love to entertain and having, you know, a keto dessert for my son. He was eight. He turned to eight yesterday and we had a big old party. And, you know, when he sees everybody else having cake on their birthday, you know, I want to be able to offer that to him. So, you know, that's why I, I do allow that type of stuff. Okay. And when you say you wouldn't allow it, I think the argument a lot of people make is that you would still see from the taste of something sweet an increase in some of what are called your incretin hormones, perhaps a small surge in, in cholecystokinin, which could spark appetite or a surge in, in insulin potentially even from simply tasting something sweet, you know, like stevia, even though it's hypocaloric. And some people say, well, that spikes your appetite later on in the day, <laughs> or you still get a little bit of a hormonal response. And again, I think part of it kind of depends on, you know, whether we're talking about like a hardcore athletes trying to limit carbohydrates versus someone yeah. doing it for full on therapy and medical management it kind yeah. of depends what camp you fall into. But I'm kind of in your bandwagon. Like, I, I don't want my food to taste like cardboard. If I'm yeah. going to have shaved ice, <laughs> I am, I don't want to just, like, chew regular ice. I'll yeah. put stevia on it. Darn it. Yeah. So, for you, what are what are the sweeteners that, that are your go-to sweeteners? Well, I say I work with a lot of type 1s and type 2 diabetics. I actually have recipe te- testers that are in both camps. And they 
test themselves with my recipes and sweeteners and they don't have response whatsoever on those. So I'll just lead with that. Um, but I do love stevia, like you said, with no additives, like you said, maltodextrin, that stevia in the raw that has maltodextrin to bind, bulk it up. And you know, that's a corn derivative. You want to stick, stay away from that. But my favorite stevia is called stevia glycerite because it's a non-bitter form of stevia. It's a thick honey-like substance. And so I usually always add a little bit of that to anything that I'm either baking or cooking and know that once you bake something, if you're tasting the batter, some of the sweetness will bake off. So it'll be less sweet, you know, once you bake it. But I do love Swerve. Swerve is an uh, an actual brand. um, And it's not because they pay me to endorse it whatsoever, but it measures. Swerve is a brand of Stevia. It has, it's a brand of erythritol and, uh, they have some other blend in there. I think it's monk fruit or, um, but it, it doesn't have that cooling effect like, uh, erythritol does, which is a sugar alcohol, um, that doesn't raise blood sugar whatsoever. Okay. The other one that you mentioned was stevia glycerite Yeah. and stevia glycerite. What you're saying is that that doesn't have a lot of the bitter effect or the bitter taste that some of these other forms of stevia can have. Right. It doesn't have that, that bitter aftertaste that turns a lot of people off that okay. when they taste something with that. So I usually... And, and is that is that in this Swerve stuff? No, it is not. Okay. Okay, gotcha. So that, so that would be something different. But you, yeah. you, kind of, you kind of pick and choose these. I know, I know you have a lot in your book about them, but, but you would say like having a, a stevia glycerite and then having something like this Swerve stevia would be like a pretty good one-two combo. Yep. Yep. So I would put, um, you know, if something called for a cup of sugar, I would probably use a half a cup of swerve, uh, a teaspoon of stevia glycerite, um, and then maybe a little bit of monk fruit, maybe a teaspoon of that just to, when you blend them, they, and they act more like what you want when you're baking it. It's all a science and they also taste a lot better too. Yeah. And, and you're okay with erythritol. Yes, that's the only sugar alcohol that doesn't affect blood sugar. When you get into like xylitol, not only is that dangerous for dogs and stuff because their intestines aren't long enough to digest it, um, they do have some glycemic effects in yeah. them. Yeah, it's great. It's great for the teeth. Xylitol is. I don't. I don't mind it on on gum. But you're correct. Yeah. Erythritol. Yeah, it can't get fermented by dental bacteria. It doesn't affect blood sugar. It doesn't affect insulin. And perhaps most importantly for a lot of people. Uh, the body absorbs it so it doesn't pass to the colon for fermentation. So it doesn't cause the same mm-hmm. amount of GI distress as a lot of these other right, sugar right. alcohols do. So that, <laughs> yes, that's... I, yeah, I made the mistake of having, when I was, you know, much, much younger, having those sugar-free candies and that was not comfortable whatsoever. And it makes you just so uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. But erythritol, I'm, I'm pretty cool with. Uh, yeah. So as far as recipes, I want to delve into some <clears throat> of your recipes. So one is something that I hadn't had for a very long time until I rediscovered it at a at a kind of like a private health retreat I was at. And they actually served this. I don't know if they got it from your book or what, oh. but they served this chicken and waffles, right? Southern comfort food, total Southern comfort food recipe. And I'm not a Southern boy. I'm from, from Idaho, but I do like chicken and waffles. And you've got your own version in keto comfort foods of chicken and waffles. So tell me yes. about so- how somebody could have chicken and waffles for breakfast or any other time of day, really, and, uh, and have it be like a, like a low carbohydrate, low glycemic index meal. You know, there's a lot of different ways you could make waffles. Um, you know, you'll see different ones on the internet using almond flour or coconut flour. But like I told you, I try to avoid nuts and seeds. Um, and so what I did was, you're going to think it's crazy, but to make the batter thick, I use hard boiled eggs and I use a little bit, you could use beef protein powder if you wanted to do like that or collagen, but that's how I make them. So there's no almond flour, there's no coconut flour. So there's no, anybody who's very metabolically sensitive will see no rise in blood sugar with those waffles. Walk me through this. How are you using hard boiled eggs and beef know, protein right? to make the waffle? Like, like just, just walk me through like how I would actually make a waffle. Okay. So I, um, I guess I don't have it right in front of me, so I'm going to tell you, you that's know, okay. Give us the basic idea. I'm going to put two raw eggs into a blender and then I'm going to put two peeled hard boiled eggs into the blender. 
So okay. it was about a one to one ratio. And then I'm going to put about two tablespoons of uh, beef protein powder. Uh, you could use other ones like an egg white protein powder or something like that. Um, they make some really tasty, you know, flavored protein powders. And then I'm going to add a little bit of stevia glycerite to make them sweet, maybe some cinnamon, a pinch of salt. Salt makes sweet things. Salt is a flavor enhancer. It's not just to make things you know, savory. It's a flavor enhancer, whether it be sweet or anything. So adding a little bit of salt to your desserts will let you add less sweetener because it's flavor enhancing. You could also add some of that butterscotch stevia that you have. <laughs> and then that would I'm actually gonna... be pretty good. Yeah, right. And then, uh, you know, have your waffle iron super hot, um, make sure it's greased well, and then you, it's going to, you know, blend that up. And then you pour that mixture and you can blend what I do oftentimes is I'll put everything in the blender the evening before I want to do something like waffles because it seems like mornings are always like rush, 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 or I'll make the waffles and then I'll freeze them just like they're an Eggo waffle. And then my kids can toast them in the toaster oven by themselves. Yeah. Now my only concern, and, and again, I don't want to get too orthorexic with this podcast is I'm pretty careful with egg white protein powder. Um, mm -hmm. the main reason being because I get concerned about oxidized cholesterol from the actual protein. They, they, there's some minimally processed whole egg powders with very little oxidation. They can be kind of expensive, but a lot of like, if you're just grabbing like egg white protein powder <laughs> off the shelf, in many cases yeah. it actually is pretty oxidized. So I'm, yeah. I'm kind of careful. I'm I'm careful with like bone broth powder for the same reason. You know, I'm, okay, I'm a, I've never had bone broth powder. Yeah, that, that yeah, that's a big know. thing now. People are like powdering bone broth, and you oxidize a lot of the amino acids and a lot of the cholesterols. And I, I think it winds up, not, you know, unless you get a very low heat processed type of yeah. type of bone broth powder, which I'm not aware of right now. Yeah, you got to be careful with some of that stuff. But ultimately, it, it it's a very interesting recipe. I hadn't I hadn't thought <sighs> before about using like whole boiled eggs and then something <laughs> like a like a well, protein powder as I a batter. Just, you know, I just played around it with it and I needed it to be thicker and I was like, Well, I don't want to add any type of gums or, you know, things like that to thicken it. What could I use? And so it just um yeah came to me and uh no knowledge is power i love that you're throwing this stuff out there because i've never heard of i mean bone broth is so easy to make i do it in the slow cooker and yeah why would you well, want to do I, a powder i do uh no I, admittedly we make bone broth but i also order it because there's a company oh, i've interviewed them on my show before uh kettle and fire does oh, like a I really good yeah, yeah really good organic bone broth chicken oh, and yeah. beef and we, yeah we we keep that around too what i like about that is one box is a perfect amount for my morning smoothie so i can use uh -huh. one box of my morning smoothie and it's like the exact texture that i need oh and it tastes so good yeah and they have a new one now they they're taking their chicken bone broth and combining it with mushrooms oh nice uh, meaning like like lion's mane mushrooms and cordyceps and stuff like that so it's kind of a Kind of a cool little combo, but yeah, I, I interviewed in them on my show. So for those of you listening in, I'll put a link to my to my interview with the folks from Kettle and Fire on the show because it's pretty good stuff. Um, that was my first, my son's first food was uh, bone broth besides uh, breast milk. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing, amazing stuff. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show. At the time that you're listening to this show, I'm in Finland. And when I go to Finland, I harvest mushrooms. And on my last mushroom harvesting trip, I actually had a chance to chop chaga off of birch trees and do a dual alcohol and water extraction with it, which was quite laborious, but which was an amazing tonic particularly for my nervous system. Chaga is an amazing elixir chock full of chemicals that strengthen the nervous system, uh, reduce joint and arthritis pain, offer anti-aging support for your skin and your hair, ton of antioxidants, ton of anti-inflammatories, and uh, this company, Four Sigmatic, based out of Finland, and I have harvested mushrooms with these guys straight over in Finland, uh, they're giving all my listeners not just a 15% discount on Chaga, but a 15% discount on all their mushrooms, their reishis, their mushroom blends, you name it. All you do is you go to foursigmatic.com slash greenfield. That's F-O-U-R, sigmatic.com slash greenfield, and you'll be able to get 15% off with coupon code greenfield. And there you have it. You're welcome, as they say in Finland, Alehova. 
Uh, and uh, in addition to that, this podcast is brought to you by the amazing, amazing Thorn Supplements. Thorn Supplements makes the highest quality supplements. They have like hundreds of thousands of dollars of health diagnostics technologies and supplement analysis machines and supplement creation technologies in their facilities about 40 minutes from my home here in Dover, Idaho. I've toured their facilities. They're one of the top brands that physicians use, chiropractic docs use. Uh, you know what you're getting when you get a Thorn supplement. It's the multivitamin that I use. Uh, it's the curcumin that I use. They have a fantastic anti-aging supplement called Resveracel. They have an amazing digestive enzyme that actually gets into your gut the right way, like a lot of them don't, called Biogest. Uh, I carry all of the Thorn supplements over at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. You just go to greenfieldfitnesssystems.com slash thorn, and you'll be able to see all of the different Thorn products that I personally endorse and highly, highly recommend to you. So check it out, Thorn over at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. And now back to ketogenesis. So uh, another thing that you talk about is something I used to stick into the microwave when I was a teenage boy <laughs> almost every day and eat like it was going out of style, and that is a keto pocket. All right. I, well, for me, it wasn't a keto pocket. It was a hot pocket. A hot but pocket. You, you have something you talk about called keto pockets. Yeah. So what what is a keto pocket? So a keto pocket is I, um, you know, again, I grew up with all of these crazy foods too. And what I did was um, I just played around and mortadella is uh, kind of like, a, what do you say, an Italian bologna, would you say? Mm hmm. Um, and it's very thin and you can get this at Trader Joe's or whatever, but you would scramble your eggs and make all the fillings. And then you're going to use a piece of mortadella around it, um, and fold it like a hot pocket. And then you just fry that up to make the mortadella a little crispy. And you can make, like I was saying, you know, I kind of, um, I plan ahead for meals. And so I'd make a few of these and then just keep them in the fridge and then fry them the morning of that we wanted to have those for breakfast. I love it. Very cool. And mortadella, by the way, for those of you listening, it's kind of like bologna. Uh, yeah. And a, a lot of times it's flavored with spices. Like I discovered when my wife and I were riding our bikes across Italy, like they'll put black pepper in it or berries. Oh, yeah. or like sometimes pistachios or different kinds of nuts will be in there. It depend, depends on what you get. But it actually is pretty tasty stuff. And, you, and you're basically using that to make, a, make your pocket, but you're using that as the actual wrap for the pocket? Yes. For the outside. So you're using that in the same way that someone might use butter lettuce or kale or nori or something like that as like a carbohydrate free wrap. You're just using meat. Yes, we're using we we joke that we are carnivores. In my and family. well, I I like it because that that's a thin enough meat to where you can kind of wrap it. Now now we do we do like these big long tubes of meat that we order from U.S. Wellness Meats, like Braunschweiger, oh, which is like a mix of. Uh, of yes! grass-fed beef and then grass-fed beef liver it's kind of, kind of very similar to like uh like a, a liverwurst they do a liverwurst as well the liverwurst is liver heart kidney and beef and these work really well for my kids to like scramble up with eggs or to just like toss in the stainless steel skillet with some olive oil but they're they're kind of crumbly so you can't use them as like a wrap uh, it's not, yeah. it sounds like this uh this um mortadella that you're using would be a little bit more conducive be a little bit less likely to fall apart if you were going to use it as a wrap yes it doesn't okay. fall apart at all and um i know exactly what you're talking about with braunschweiger because my dad he loved that on you know ritz crackers and it was always the stuff that had a lot of bad fillers in it that, yeah you know, he just yeah i would imagine where you get your mortadella would probably be something you'd want to take into consideration as well you know obviously yeah, for you, sure you are what you eat eight so make sure it's the the good organic stuff but yeah that's really interesting i i will by the way for those of you listening in everything that marie and i talk about for for recipes and her books and stuff i'll link to if you just go to ben greenfield com slash keto cleanse that's awesome. ben greenfield com slash keto cleanse uh, so another thing that you talk about is, it seems like every ketogenic book has this in it, but I'm curious to hear about your twist, a fat bomb. Tell me yeah. about the fat bomb. What's the fat bomb? Well, a fat bomb is something that I utilize to help people in the beginning when they're still having, you know, 
cravings, whether it be sugar cravings or hunger, most of the time it takes people, you know, two to three weeks to a month to adapt to, you know, hunger going away um, and that type of stuff. So a fat bomb, a lot of times would help people just get rid of that hunger because that's what fat is very satiating. And many times you'll see fat bombs made with like cream cheese or, you know, peanut butter and nut butters. And obviously this book is dairy and nut free. So it's none of that. So <laughs> um, I usually use, you know, like coconut oil and you can use that butterscotch stevia that I need to get some of that because I love butterscotch. Yeah. It's, it's the Omica organic stuff. Omica organic. I will look that up. Yeah. But it's basically just a little fat bomb to help with things like that. Okay. Okay. Got it. And so, so the recipe again, just for people who want to make their own fat bomb, what's, what's the go-to recipe? I use coconut oil. And there's a little bit of coconut milk in there. Um, I use cocoa powder. So this one is a chocolate one. It's very, very easy. A lot of kids really like it. I actually use a little English uh, toffee stevia in there and a, a little bit of cinnamon. You stir it all up and then you can pour it into molds and then cut it into squares. So it's like a, it reminds a lot of people of fudge. Okay, got it. Cool. I have my own little version of this where I'll take like a like a full fat coconut milk, like like oh, a yeah. native forest, for example, does like a BPA free coconut milk. And then I'll put some unsweetened coconut flakes in there, uh, typically some kind of like a dark cacao powder. And then that yeah. same stevia I mentioned, and I'll whisk all that up and just stir it up really quickly and then throw that in the freezer. And if I do that before dinner, by the time dinner's done, I'll take that out and it's kind of got the consistency Perfect. of ice cream. And you can also blend it, but if you just, Where's if you're lazy. Where's your cookbook, Ben? Uh, I've, I've, no, got a few, I've got a few recipes in, in my, in my uh, Beyond Training book. And, and that, one, that one actually is in there. Uh, awesome. Okay, so back to things that we wouldn't traditionally expect to be ketogenic. Fruit salad. You've got fruit <laughs> salad on there. Fill me in on how you can do a fruit salad that's, that's well, like a low glycemic ketogenic yeah. food. It's kind of a joke because everybody's like, oh, Maria, do you eat fruit? And I'm like, absolutely. We love olives and we love tomatoes. And, you know, so it's kind of like all those not like caper berries, you know, capers and things like that, which are more salty than anything. Cucumbers, that type of stuff. So it's a fruit salad. It reminds me of a Greek salad with um, olives and capers, tomatoes, cucumber. It's basically a Greek salad, but it is technically all with fruit. Okay. Are you using like low glycemic index fruits like berries and no, uh, no, raspberries, the, blackberries, blueberries, things like that? Or No, no. It's uh, cucumber, olives, tomatoes. Okay, so there's no fruit at all. There, that is fruit, though, technically. Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. They are. The, those, are the <laughs> so over, those are the ovaries of plants, right? <laughs> Yeah, so that's why it's kind of Sneaky. a joke because I yeah, it's uh it's the way we enjoy our fruit. It's uh, you know, low glycemic and all of that. It's more of a savory Greek salad. I and what's say. and what's the yeah, I was going to say it's more more like Greek salad. What's what's yeah. the uh, dressing that you're using? The dressing is using that yeah, MCT oil um and then some Greek seasoning um that type of stuff. You could use olive oil if you had that instead, a good quality one. Okay. Okay. Got it. Cool. So that's obviously the fruit salad. That's not really, I would, I would honestly, if it were me, I would still throw blueberries in there. I'm a big fan. If there's one fruit that I'll eat that you'll actually find around my house, it's blueberries or another one that, well, there's two that I harvest from our land here is very small tart berries that really are extremely low on the glycemic index. And from a nutrient density versus a calorie standpoint or a flavanol and a polyphenol mm -hmm. standpoint, or they're very they're very sirtuin rich too s i r t u i n and that's a that's a class of uh, proteins that's associated with uh, with uh, anti aging actually nice. uh, so it's, so it's very interesting they they have a lot of what's called deacylase activity uh, but any of any of these very dark kind of tart berries are pretty rich yeah. in sirtuin so oh I'm not I, judging I, I it was just yeah. kind of a joke you know. A, Oh, I hear you. I, I get people. I get where you're coming from. You're you're a lot more strict than I am with some of this stuff. But it, but that's I, I love to go through your recipes here, uh, which brings me to the next one: keto bread. You do a keto yeah. bread. So I'm curious what your keto bread looks like because like we do a low glycemic index bread, which means that we take local non GMO red wheat berries from the Palouse, and my wife ferments them and makes a sourdough. And when you ferment, wow. of course you you lower the glycemic index and uh, 
that of course is one way to do it, but I think you're not even using like wheat or coconut flour, or almond flour, or anything like no. that. Is that correct? No, and the cleanse, and that's why, like, I don't, you know, the word cleanse, people don't, they think that it's like, I'm going to be drinking my calories and things like that. Nope. I love, I love everything about chewing your food. I think it's so satiating and everybody likes the bread. And so, um, the thing, the reason why I called it the cleanse is because it's dairy and nut free to make it really successful. So what you do is you take egg whites, you separate your eggs. So you have your yolks and your whites and you put the whites preferably into a stand mixer because you're going to want to whip it for about eight minutes. And I have a video on this because it's a little tricky and you whip it until those whites are really, really stiff. And then you're going to add your, uh, you know, your quality protein powder, whatever form it is. I, I don't like whey first because it's dairy and it also dumps into your bloodstream faster than other protein powders. So I describe all of that on how to choose one. And then you can slowly stir those yolks back in there. So you get that, you know, the nice soft yolks, and then you put that into your bread pan and bake them and you can make them into buns or whatever, but that's basically the keto bread. What's the texture like on those? People say it's like wonder bread. Really? Yeah. Cause it's just like white bread. But the problem is, is especially in the summer, if you have a humid house, if you touch those whites at all with a spatula that has a touch of water or you put it into a bread pan that has a touch of water you're they're gonna fall and you're gonna get a gummy bread and you're gonna come and complain to me uh if you have cream of tartar in your house you could add a teaspoon of that to stabilize your whites but i would say the biggest mistake is people under whip them because they read that if you over whip them it's gonna ruin them but i'll i'll let my stand mixer go for 10 minutes i'll go outside and water the plants or and then i put it yeah, and then and you just use one of the countertop stand mixers yep yep i just yeah, let it those go those work well my wife does a lot with that as well yeah i, I told you i'm not a gadget person that's mm-hmm. something i use all the time all the time those hand mixers are just they just don't do it <laughs> well, you just yeah you just let them go and walk away that's what i like yeah. about the stand mix- mixers they need to do something like that except it's like a latte frother because i've been making a lot oh, of yeah. green tea matcha green tea lately and matcha green tea whether it's hot or whether it's cold is really good if you whisk it so if anybody knows of any good uh good ways to do like a like a similar to a stand mixer but like a a walk away and let it froth type of mixer for tea leave a comment over in the show notes <laughs> at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash keto cleanse because i'd i'd totally check that out i'll watch for um that. okay refried beans is another one tell me about how you make healthy refried beans uh, now you're talking a, about is the something restaurant that's ketogenic one. yeah you, you talk about this in your restaurant book yeah um so a lot of people are afraid of smoking foods. They just, they look at a smoker, they're intimidated. Oh man, it is so easy to smoke food. And especially the vegetarians I work with, you know, they, you know, want that meaty flavor. And what I do is I smoke eggplant or you could smoke your zucchini. Like you were talking about the squash earlier and you actually puree this, um, with a couple different ingredients, but it makes this bean like texture that you know people just miss because you know beans aren't you know on the ketogenic diet but it tastes great with any mexican type food you could add if you aren't vegetarian some bacon to that adds even a better flavor um and the bacon fat goes right in there and you puree that up until it's smooth just like a refried bean okay so walk me through this one more time you're actually so so how are you making these Okay, so there's two different ways, and there's two different recipes in that restaurant book. Um, one is a vegetarian way where you smoke the eggplant. And so you slice the eggplant thin into slices, and you're going to salt that up, and you're going to put it into a smoker. And I have a video on how to smoke foods. Um, it's super easy. It's one of my favorite ways because it's a very low temperature. It's not causing issues with meat and things like that. Uh, that you were referring to earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you're going to, you you would take the peel off too, unless you want to keep it on there. It's going to add a little bit of texture, but you throw blender, you add some salt, you could add some, I I guess I don't have it right in front of me, but that's basically, you you puree it up into beans. Now, if you wanted to do it over a stovetop, if you don't have a smoker, you would cut up pieces of bacon and fry Mm -hmm. that up and leave the bacon fat in there and add your cubed eggplant 
So you peel it and slice it into like inch size pieces. It doesn't really matter, but you're going to fry that up. And that eggplant soaks up all that mm. yummy bacon grease flavor. And, wow. um, you know, you want to add some salt. bacon fat. Wow. I, that was actually one of my son's first foods was I used lard and a uh, bone marrow and eggplant. And I would bake that, the bone marrow right over the eggplant. And as the bone marrow cooks, that slimy stuff comes out. Most people scoop it up with bread, but I let it soak into the eggplant. And he just loved that. I may have to try this. My kids and I are making dinner tomorrow night and we're going <laughs> to do some, some wild plant foraging. And I want to go out and get a get nettles and make this this new nettle recipe i, I read oh. about it's kind of like an old native american recipe with like a little bit of raw milk and and a raw local honey and some of our nettles and nettle seeds uh kind of made into a little bit of a tea and that, oh. that's about as far as i've gotten so far for planning dinner that's like that's like how we're going to start dinner off but that's uh, awesome. i'm gonna have to try some of these healthy fried refried beans because i've got bacon fat and i can hunt me down some eggplants so I'll have to try this one out because I actually like this idea of using eggplants and bacon fat. That, that to me Thanks. sounds like a pretty good one-two combo. So I'll, I'll give it a go and, and let you know what I think. Awesome. Uh, okay, so we've got refried beans. We've got ketogenic bread, ketogenic, quote, fruit salad, unquote. This amazing chicken and waffles recipe that I really want to try. Uh, and then you kind of get into some other things that I wanted to touch on in your restaurant book and in your comfort foods book. One thing that you talk about in the restaurant book that blew my mind, because a lot of people who are doing like a low carbohydrate diet will get omelets or, you know, some some type of an egg mixture at a restaurant when they go to a restaurant. Yeah. Tell me what you say in the book about omelet batter, because this one I was totally aware <gasps> of. There are some uh, diners that actually will add a little bit of uh, pancake batter to, but what was really disturbing to me is I was at a hotel and it was kind of a pretty nice hotel in Breckenridge at the low carb conference that I was at. And I was scooping up some scrambled eggs and someone said, you know, those are powdered eggs. I was like, what are powdered eggs? And like you said, they were mm -hmm. just eggs that were powdered. They added milk to them. And so it was probably quite high in carbohydrates, highly processed. I was like, Right. It's easier than cracking an egg open. But you have a huge, huge amount of milk sugar in most of the powdered eggs that you're going to find at, at, at hotels. And even some of these, like you mentioned, like the fancier, nicer buffet breakfast they actually had. They had a lot of milk. Um, yeah. They add, as you mentioned in the book, they'll add like pancake batter to yep. the almond batter. Uh, they've certainly done studies and you can find these in PubMed on oxidized cholesterol levels and cholesterol particles in the body and, you know, the things that are a probable primary cause of atherosclerotic lesions. Oh. And, and one of the primary components of this are, uh, are just basic commercial, uh, dried eggs and dried egg yeah. powder. It's one of the worst things you can do for your body. You know, we all are aware now that, you know, egg yolks are probably pretty good <laughs> for you. And, yeah. you know, there are books like eat the yolk and this idea that eggs are not responsible for cardiovascular disease, but when you heat them and you dry them, you can create some some pretty big issues. And yeah, uh, yeah I mean, that that's why I even recommend, and again, a guy I mentioned earlier, Dr. Mercola, who I had on my show, he talks a lot about like, even when you're making your scrambled eggs, and I gave my kids this lecture because they do scrambled eggs now every morning, cook it at a very low, low, low temp. temperature, yeah. and you cook it just the, the, the minimal amount that you actually need to. So, yeah, and that's just yeah. that. They usually cook them in vegetable oil and stuff. I uh, speak right. on the low carb cruise a lot. Um, right. And going to the buffet, I always say, could you use the real eggs? And then I usually hand them uh, a pat of butter. So I feel that even, you know, if you do have dairy issues, that's better than the vegetable oil that they're using. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course you look at the fact that they're kind of languishing under heat lamps for several hours exposed <laughs> to heat and light and air after having been cooked in industrial seed oil. Yeah. It's, it's, it can be an issue. Uh, okay. So another thing uh, that you talk about in uh, your, your comfort foods book, and, and by the way, how would you define a comfort food? What, what's that? How, how would do you I define, define it? a comfort food? Because for me, I just think back to things I liked to eat when I was a kid. But I'm curious yeah. if there's like an official definition of comfort foods because I don't think I've oh. actually had a, a comfort foods author on the show before. I guess that's how I felt. Things that make you, you know, foods that you think about that you remember making you, you know, 
you would sit down and have with your family or just something that makes you warm and fuzzy inside when you think about it. Um, that was kind of what I thought about. And then I also thought about Southern food that people just, I mean, the Southern food really makes like chicken and waffles, you know, that type of stuff or gumbo, um, crawfish etouffee, those type of things really make me think of comfort foods. Right. Exactly. It's the, what I, what I always do when I get home from a long journey, whether or not I've eaten on the airplane or in the airport or not, I walk in the house and I open up the refrigerator and I look for the foods that I know are going to be in there that I consider to be now my comfort foods. You know, my comfort foods back when I was growing up would have been, you know, the 29 cent hamburger from McDonald's Ah. and Kraft macaroni and cheese and, of course, those Hot Pockets. And now when I open up the refrigerator, I definitely look for mom's or my wife's uh, homemade kombucha Yep. Big fan of that stuff. Usually she has something pickled or fermented. Like she'll have like some kind of like a pickled or fermented radish or carrot mm-hmm. or green tomato. And those again, like, like it's just like this, this thing. I open up the mason jar and I grab it. It's the feel, it's the texture, it's the pop in the mouth. Yeah. Um, I, I am a, a fan of, of taking out some of that sourdough bread and I'll, I'll toast that and have that with, with a couple slices of whatever protein or fat I can happen mm-hmm. to find in the refrigerator. But there are these little things that I grab. And and you, of course, get a little bit, uh, I guess, f- more fancy in your book on comfort <laughs> foods with all sorts of different comfort foods. But what what would you say if you could choose like your favorite recipe from your comfort foods book as far as like something that you think should be on everybody's bucket list to try, what would it be? Um, the bananas foster for two. <laughs> all right. Fill me in. Um, it's just, I think a lot of times, and I have this problem too, like I'm a product of, like, I grew up telling, my mom told me, you know, finish everything on your plate. So I'm a product of the clean your plate club. And so I like making smaller desserts so I don't eat the whole thing. Um, but I love bananas foster and I think that it's just fantastic. And the caramel sauce is amazing. And, um, there's actually no bananas in it. I use banana extract, an I organic one. Yeah, yeah. So, so well, bananas foster, which I, which I've had before. A big part of that is kind of like, you know, taking your fork and like slicing through the banana, going through the caramelization yeah. and the hard part. Then you have the soft banana inside. How are you achieving that? So I made little cakes um, that were you know long tube like like a banana, and so you have you know, basically three little Twinkie type looking things that have banana flavor. And then you have a scoop of keto ice cream and some whipping cream whipped on top of that. And then you put your caramel sauce on top of that. And then some walnuts. Uh, The comfort food book is not nut free and it is not dairy free. I'll tell you that. Mm. It is all about, you know, comfort keto foods. Yeah. So it's still extremely calorie rich, just not carbohydrate rich. Absolutely. Yeah. That it's sounds... just for, for me, uh, my journey was a really long one. Some people, they really want to heal super fast. They want to lose weight, like, you know, you really super fast. But for me, it was a slow process. And that's why I really love these books, because if you just want to start lowering your carbohydrates and still be really satisfied, you know, it works that way too. You know, like you said, you still have, you know, squash and things like that. If you want it to be slower and, you know, it it works that way too. So. Yeah. You, the books are jam packed with all sorts (laughs) of food, porn and mouthwatering recipes. So (laughs) I, I do highly recommend that if you're listening in and you want some new ideas and I am going to try this refried bean recipe, I think tomorrow night I'm going to, because my kids and I love to cook stuff together for mom sometimes because she Mm. works so hard. Usually some day, days of the week cooking, we like to put some food on the table every now and again. And, and for me, it's usually trying weird things that I've talked about with people on podcasts. So, um, so anyways, if you want to try any of these recipes, then, uh, check out bengreenfieldfitness.com slash keto cleanse. And over there, I will link to Maria's ketogenic cleanse book, but then also this keto comfort foods book and the keto restaurant favorites book. And then I'll also, for you guys who want to buy any of the things we talked about, I'll link to that liver worst that we order from the <laughs> wellness meats uh, and, and the kettle and fire bone broth too, along with some of the forms of stevia that we talked about. Uh, Maria, thank you so much for taking a break from your hike today <laughs> and joining You'll us. You'll have to check out the hike we took to try to find you. 
uh, try to find internet service. I posted it on Instagram. If you check that out, I oh, you, you did. Okay. Yeah, we were. We were in some bad thunderstorms the last few days, so uh, it's a real watery hike. You'll have to check it out. It looks like we're hiking through a waterfall. Nice. And, and that's with just, just you and, and one of your eight-year-olds or all your kids? Uh, my six and eight-year-old, yeah. Six and eight-year-old. Nice. I love it. All right, cool. I'll check that out on Instagram. Thanks. Maybe we'll use that as the, as the, as the show artwork. <laughs> Um, anyways, thanks. well, thanks for joining me and uh, enjoy the rest of your time in the wilderness out there. Take a cold shower. And uh, and I'll keep in touch. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful. All right, folks. This is Ben Greenfield and Maria Emmerich, the author of a whole host of books on ketogenic diet. Signing out from bengreenfieldfitness.com slash keto cleanse. Have a healthy week. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice.